Welcome to Inspiring Teachers, a show bringing you classroom tips, motivation, and stories from successful educators. Join Tavis Beam and Danny Hogger as they explore the why of teaching. Welcome back to another episode of Inspiring Teachers. I'm Tavis Beam. Along with me is... Ladies first, right? Oh! <laughs> Hi, Melissa Aiello Beam. And I'm Danny Hogger. And Melissa Aiello Beam here is my wife, and she's also a kindergarten teacher. Welcome to the show, honey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> How come you never called me honey before? <laughs> I'll go with sweetie. <laughs> I'll accept that. Okay. Welcome to the show, honey. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. So can you uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm a kindergarten teacher. It's my eighth year teaching. I've taught kindergarten all eight years. Yeah. <laughs> and so can you tell us a little bit about what made you want to become a teacher? I think in the beginning I was really idealistic and you know I want to do have a positive impact on the future and I mean not that that's not realistic but I just always wanted to be a teacher ever since I was six years old. I actually wanted to be an artist first and then at six years old I decided that wasn't very practical so I said okay. Career aptitude in first grade. Very pragmatic. Exactly. Six it's time to set a path. All right. You had your animal crackers and it's time to get to work. Exactly. So um, then I decided that maybe I would be an art teacher and then it just kind of transformed into wanting to be a regular elementary school. It's interesting because you're the only one of the three of us that went to college and got your credential at the same time. Did you envision it would always be uh, an elementary grade and a young level of teaching? Um, yeah, pretty much. And what was the journey through the college process like, since neither one of us went for the express purpose of getting your credential by the end of it? Yeah, I would say they were somewhat practical and applicable, um, but I think the best part was that they really got us in classrooms right away, freshman year of college. I think it was the second semester. We mm -hmm. started kind of volunteering in preschool classrooms, and then... Every year after that, we would spend a couple days, a um, couple hours, a couple days a week in an elementary school classroom volunteering. So, you know, they got us in classrooms right away. Your teaching on day one is different than your teaching in year eight. Well, I had a really interesting experience my first year teaching because I shared two classrooms with two other teachers. So there were three of us. And I was the teacher that went back and forth between the So I also started in November, so it was kind of an adjustment period coming in the like middle of the school year, pretty much, and trying to earn the respect of the kids. And I think that, you know, now year eight, I'm a lot more confident in myself and my teaching ability. So why kindergarten? I don't think I've ever asked you that. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, you know, it's funny because I think I always saw kindergarten as just like, totally insane and not doable at all um, until there was a classroom that I observed in that was a kindergarten class and you know the teacher had total control of them and they were doing amazing things and I was like wow maybe kindergarten is actually doable um, so then when I was student teaching I did my second placement in a kindergarten class and I loved it I just felt very at home and you know the kids are still really full of wonder at that age and they love learning so. They haven't done their first grade aptitude test yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you enjoy most about kindergarten? Um, you know, they just surprise me every day. Um, <laughs> and they're just really sweet. And they make me laugh. Um, you know, and they're just so innocent. Like, you can't really hold anything against them. Mm -hmm. You know, because everything they've learned, it's just from outside sources. Right. And what do you think some of the challenges that kindergarten teachers face that other teachers don't face? Oh, I think there's definitely the challenge of trying to balance like developmentally appropriate practices with the high standards that we're holding them to because mm -hmm. you know they're five and six and some of them are just not ready to read and write and mm -hmm. add and subtract yet but you know we need them to be doing those things by the end of the school year in order to be successful in first grade and beyond. Yeah. And I, I know that when we talk about kindergarten, a lot of people still think that it's just nap time and eating paste and coloring outside the lines. And you know, that's, that, that impression needs to be uh, changed a lot. I mean, can you talk a little bit about some of the rigor that the kindergarten students are put under? Yeah, I mean... They need to be writing multiple sentences by the end of the school year and using spaces between their words, using correct 
capitalization and periods at the end and reading books with, you know, multiple sentences per page. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then like adding and subtracting, <laughs> uh, subtracting up mm -hmm. to 10, counting to 100. I yeah. mean, yeah, yeah. Lots changed since I was in kindergarten. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it was a lot more, I feel like a lot more play-based right. when we were kids. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I still let my students play, but it's definitely, there's a lot more pressure to have them reach those academic goals. Yeah, it sounds like there's more accountability. I wonder since, for some of them that don't attend preschool, you're kind of the first adult that's not their parent that imprints on them for a lot of hours. Do you think about that much? Um, you know, I do, and one of my number one goals, really, for being a kindergarten teacher is to develop a love of learning in them and a love of school, you know, because I figure they're going to be in school for, what, 12 more years after mm -hmm. that? You know, so I really want to build that foundation of them, mm -hmm. of wanting to come to school and of liking school. You know, I do see it when I have students from, you know, three, four years ago still come up to me and tell me they love my class and, you know, say they miss me. And, you know, sometimes I have kids in the upper grades come help out in my classroom, like of their own free choice, you mm -hmm. know, because they want to be in there again and help me out. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I just want to have a positive impact on them and on their schooling. Well, you mentioned that they've moved on now, so some of the kids who you started with are going to get ready for high school next year. What's something when they move on from you and they're going off to summer that you hope that they've learned from you, besides just the things that you teach them day to day with curriculum? <laughs> I guess just, you know, how how to treat others mm -hmm. well, you know, and how to be kind and how to solve conflicts with one another in a productive way. Mm -hmm. uh, That's great. We've talked about some quotes in the past that have been meaningful to us or that have motivated us about the way we go about and do our work or that gives a fresh perspective. And you brought in something and that you thought was kind of inspirational. What was the quote that you are bringing in today. Yeah, it's funny because this was a quote I saw on a door of a high school that I subbed at once. And it's, life without knowledge is death in disguise. Mm -hmm. and it's from a rapper, Talib Kweli. I thought that was really profound. Yeah, it's true. It reminds me a little bit of the Super Bowl commercial that ran from the Washington Post that said democracy dies in darkness. Mm -hmm. That, you know, without knowledge, we live kind of darkened, dimmed lives. I talked to Melba Beals, who was one of the Little Rock Nine in Central Arkansas. And she said that education is absolutely the key out and the key up in life. That when we are educated, we're armed with more tools to succeed in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think all three of us are trying to create students that are more engaged and more prepared and ready to be successful in life. So that's a very, very good quote. Um, absolutely. So when we think about other words of advice, this week I pulled a few tweets from some of our teachers and some friends of the show. And I wonder if we might be able to lend some thoughtfulness on our panel today. So we'll start with Brian Aspinall, who quoted uh, today and tweeted, Our job is to teach the students we have, not the ones we would like to have, not the ones we used to have, those we have right now. Yeah. All of them. So Brian, thanks for sending that comment over to us. I know that that's big for me, having switched schools. And we've all switched schools, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's something we've all gone through? Yep. Oh, at some point? At yeah, some yes, point, yes. we started over. And we school. do that thing like we do when we work other jobs, which is, in my old work, I used to do this, or say this. And so when I transitioned from private middle school to public high school, I still occasionally will think of how students needed different things from me then, and how they need different things from me now. But I need to do the best to teach the students I have today. Right. So I'm, I try to listen to them and what they're saying in class. I try to look at their facial expressions to think, what are they thinking while they're saying this? Do they mean what they're saying? Are they saying what they think I want to hear? What are they trying to achieve? And then I also try to think, um, what did they need to hear? What messages are they lacking or could help them unlock a new door to thinking about something different? What does the, the sentiment that Brian shared mean to either of you? Well, for me, it really makes me think about kind of the heart of the show that we keep coming back to, which is relationship. And that's kind of the why so many teachers have talked about, like, why do you really get up? It's not the love of science. It's not the love of writing. It's the love of the relationship. And if you're thinking about the student that you have rather than the student that you want, mm -hmm. it's demanding of you being present True. in this moment with this person, this individual, not some other idealized version of what a student means in this kind of platonic idea of like, like out here. It's like, no, this is the student. This, these are the problems that they face on a daily basis, and I am here for them. That's good. 
Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think that relationships with your students are so important. Um, you know, I feel like if you respect them and they respect you, then they're more willing to learn from you and to, you know, enjoy going to your class. And, mm -hmm. you know, I really think that's what, <clears throat> like, brings those old students of mine coming back, you know, is the relationships that we developed when they were in my class. Mm -hmm. That's strong. I like what both of you said. And to close before we transition, I think when we think about the students we have now, we think about the context that they're in now, too. Mm -hmm. So for high school and middle school, and probably for elementary, too, if there's something in the headlines that everyone's talking about, then maybe we need to stop the standard for a second and talk about the context of the moment. Right. So that's pretty good. Thanks, Brian, for sharing with that. We appreciate that. The next is a guest of ours that we've had and a friend of the show. Danny Steele is a principal in the Midwest. And he says, there are some kids I can't figure out how to motivate. I just can't seem to get through to them. Maybe you have some of those students, too. I don't know the answer, but I do know this. We must keep supporting them. We must keep encouraging them. And we must keep loving them. And what I've enjoyed from our show in doing this over the past few months is, how many teachers that aren't afraid to use the word love in the context of students and in caring deeply and just being honest of what that is? Mm -hmm. It's true. Like We're not trying to dedicate all of our time, 40 hours a week, plus all the hours we spend outside of school, plus all the hours we spend planning in our summer and our weekends to not care for students. Right? right? We're trying to do the best things for them. And it hurts sometimes when people misinterpret the things we're doing or don't understand what we're really all about. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of that with Danny's question? Well, I think, again, they, they might not be interested in that topic that you're talking about, but they might be interested in you. Mm -hmm. And they might be in interested in that relationship. So if you are supporting them, if you are loving them, they might you know, despise school, they might despise what you're learning in the class, but that relationship that they have with you, with that teacher, is what brings them to school every day. And will might maybe carry them through out their entire education. I think loving your students is so important. I mean, I call my students, my babies, <laughs> you know, and maybe it's because they're little, mm -hmm. but, you know, they are my babies, and, you know, I care about them so much. Yeah, and I mean, motivating them, I mean, with the little ones, usually I make everything a game, <laughs> and that helps to motivate them. And, That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of them, you know, still need a little bit of extra motivation, mm -hmm. so, you know, I have a lot of positive that's solid. You make us a, a good memory here too in that we all loved playing games in kindergarten. We shouldn't assume that kids don't like playing games anymore, that they're too mature. Mm -hmm. Give yeah, them a chance really to prove true. it. You yeah. know, they, maybe they, um, they won't love it, but maybe you'll open up a pathway towards being playful again and that'll open up doors to get motivated in a different way. It's not always getting behind somebody and kicking them in the pants to get them going. That's right. not how everybody responds right. to you. So. Well, and I like to bounce off that actually because yeah. you brought up your positive reinforcement. And I know one thing that you're really good at is using behavior charts and actually following through on the positive reinforcement side of that behavior chart. Could you speak a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, so um, I have a behavior chart. It's like a clip chart with their names on the clips, you know, and there's a couple different levels. They all start at ready to learn and then let's see, excellent effort, role model, outstanding. And if they get up to outstanding, they get a rhinestone on their clip. And if they get five rhinestones, they go to the sparkling behavior board. And it's a really big deal. We all do a cheer for them, hmm. you know, and we got a new clip. And we got to 100 clips on the sparkling behavior board. We had a party, and it was a party of their choosing. So it was candy and Hatchimals. <laughs> That's what they voted for. I'm not going to pretend to know what that is, and you've explained it to me. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. And, and, and would you say, or please tell us, which works better? The negative side or the positive <laughs> side? Are they equally, um, or, or is one better than the other? I mean, definitely the positive. Mm -hmm. You know, I always try to emphasize the positive things that kids are doing. Mm -hmm. You know, like, wow, so-and-so is sitting on their bottom, or yeah. thanks for walking quietly in line. Yeah. You know, I just feel like it's so much more effective than... Right. Stop running. Yeah. You know, sit on your bottom. Or I guess that's a positive way of saying it, but. And that's the know. thing is that there, I feel like there's a, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, shun a, a behavior chart, but that's probably because most of their experience with behavior charts have been just negative, literally just negative. Yeah, uh, and exactly. And it's, I do have a negative half of it. There's, you know, two sections in the warning section and then mm -hmm. they go to timeout. Right. I remember when I was in elementary school, we had the pocket chart with all the different cards, and it was, you know, like, 
green, yellow, red, and then, you know, I don't remember what was after that. I think red was used in the office at that point. But there was a, like, a purple card, which was better than green. I don't remember anybody ever getting it. I don't remember ever getting it. I don't think it was ever honestly used. Um, but it's funny, on my behavior chart, the positive one is red, the negative one is purple. Mm. Because usually it's the other way around, right, right. and I decided to switch it up this year just mm -hmm. to not have negative connotations to certain colors. Yeah, you'll have negative connotations to other certain colors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're going to go to their next class like, what? <laughs> Mind blown. <laughs> Always reach for red, kids. Uh, the last third and final quote that we'll talk about here and uh, is by Dr. Nathan Lang Rad, and he says, Our job is not to teach the students, it's to break the standards apart, discover what's interesting about them to students, and then create learning experiences to bridge the two. So I'll start with this one because what I think we, we fail to look at at a social studies perspective is just because the standard is X doesn't mean you can't teach X and Y together mm -hmm. and build relationships mm -hmm. between the two. So one of the things we're studying right now is the 1950s. I get all jazzed about it because war is over so we can stop talking about death and destruction and start talking about culture, music, movies, art, food, uh, franchises, lots of stuff that's relative. So I built a, a resource that was Pick a year between 1950 and 60, pick a modern year in the last five years, compare the top artists, the top movies, the top um, music, everything, what's different, what's controversial, how much money is it making, how's it helping the economy, what's being exported, what are our top acts and musicians and songs, and they really got into it. Mm -hmm. I think if I would have said go research music of the 50s, mm -hmm. five kids would have been excited. Right. But I think a lot of people. Since you had to compare it with modern day music and yeah. see the similarities and differences, you were literally bridging the standards yeah. to something that's relevant. To Absolutely. Them. And they got to spend time listening to Ariana Grande for a second, right. you know, or Taylor Swift, and then talking about that. And they were really excited and they were having fun. And I'm like, you don't even know you're not supposed to be having fun right now. Mm -hmm. And it's great, right? It's such a fun time and we can do that. And it's great and enjoyable. And that's what I like about creating resources for social studies. By the way, the Hogger History Store on Teachers Pay Teachers is a wonderful resource for things like that. <laughs> what do you guys think? Yeah, sure. um, well, you know, I'm a woodshop teacher. Why do kids enjoy my class? Because it's relevant. Right? So they're measuring, they're doing math, they're applying themselves, they're focusing, and it's all things that they understand are somewhat relevant. They see the practical application of it, and it's just inherently fun in what we're doing. It doesn't have to be, you know, the teacher standing at the front of the classroom talking to the class and expecting them to uh, absorb all the information, spray and pray. Uh, we, we can engage them in a multiple different ways to uh, excite them about what they're learning. And that's why I really love where I've ended up, you know, after teaching math and science and elementary school, I really feel like I can reach these kids in a whole new way that is relevant to them. Yeah, um, like I was saying, you know, in kindergarten, I try to make a lot of things a game for them to keep them motivated and engaged. So, um, you know, one of the things the book has me do is there's different different picture cards, and they have to figure out, you know, if this picture starts with Y or Z. So, you know, I have popsicle sticks with their names on it, and I, you know, randomly choose kids to come up, and mm -hmm. you know, I give them the card, and they put it where they think it's supposed to go, and then we all say like, "Wow, good job, so and so." You know, and they get to pick who goes next, and then the last person gets to be the counter. Well, that's a really big deal, because they get to count all the cards. <laughs> and they get to use my special pointer. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. You build in, like, things that yeah. make them special. And so it's not just routine. You're having yeah. a good time. Exactly. So we're reaching a Friday. I'm about to start my spring break here. I thought maybe the last thing we could do is, if you could think of something fun that you like to do that is a go-to for a quick laugh or something that you enjoy, and I'll start to give you guys a second to think. Maybe a moment from your week that was just a fun moment. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love to do, and I know I'm doing well in a week if I remind myself to go do this, I have a prep. We, we're fortunate to have one during our schedule. We have block classes. I go into classes that aren't mine, mm -hmm. and I find some students who are mine, and that's so much fun because right. then I'm not required. I'm not teaching anything. It's not my instructional time. But just do something goofy. Mm -hmm. So I'll sit down with a table of students where I know someone. I'll introduce myself to the other uh, students at the table. And they were reading today in English class, Their Eyes Were Watching God. Mm -hmm. And someone said, Mr. Hogger, have you read this book? I said, no, my eyes were watching Netflix. And it's like, it's almost borderline disruptive because I'm sitting down and they're supposed to be working. But let them see you in a light that's right. different, that you're a human and you like to think funny things and have them um, just see you in a different characteristic. I also played the staff softball game this week. 
I worked in broadcasting for five years with baseball, and they sent me to go play second base, and I lined up where the shortstop is, which is on the, on the other side. Like, what? over there, dude, what are you doing? And then they played toss, and I wasn't looking, and I missed the ball. And people are laughing all over the place, like, what, what is he doing? Like, what is he, he, didn't he work in broadcasting? <laughs> you know? Just things like that, that don't take yourself too seriously, mm. because then you can really enjoy what you're doing, and you don't have to be such a serious person all the time. How about for you guys? Well, I mean, for me, one thing I like to do, because most of my students are, are working, right? They're, they're engaged in their activity, and I'm not teaching most of the day, which has been kind of a, a shift for me. So sometimes I'm in, inundated with just tons and tons of students asking me questions, but when they're not, it's just fun to make the rounds and mm -hmm. go around and just kind of goof off with them a little bit and have fun and be playful mm -hmm. and kind of drop the serious teacher student relationship just right. a, just a smidge and just give them that little bit of a smile yeah. and yeah and I know for me personally another thing I like to do when um, I'm at school and I'm on prep and maybe I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed is I like woodworking it's why I took this job mm -hmm. and so oftentimes it's just like I've got all this stuff I need to get done and I'm stressed out about it I'm gonna go work on something I'm gonna go work on the next project I want to teach the kids I'm gonna go figure the next thing out that it, it also inspires me and activates part of my, my learning, which is what I love doing so much as well. And for you? Yeah, I mean, I think just showing the kids that you're human, you have a sense of humor, mm -hmm. you know, like if I make a mistake, oh, like sometimes, I, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I forget to write the number for how many days we're in school. And, you know, I'll let kids, you know. <laughs> oh, they totally call me out on it, and I just go, oh, silly Mrs. Beam, you know, and then when... I do something again, they go, silly Mrs. B, oh, that's great, you know, or just like silly little things, like if they ask me to open their snack for them, I'll be like, oh, so this is for me, like you're giving this to me, wow, thank you, and they're like, no, that's mine. <laughs> it's so much fun. Yeah. Those are always good moments, those callbacks are great, and uh, we appreciate you so much joining yeah, us. Yeah, thank you, you honey, and thank you, sweetie. <laughs> you're welcome. I really appreciate uh, the time that we've spent together today. You want to do the outro today? Yeah, you say goodbye to the... the... Oh, goodbye. <laughs> well, tell them class dismissed. Class dismissed. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Down in the comments, what do you like to do for fun in your classrooms? And thank you so much for joining us. Until next time. Meet next. Next. We'll talk to you soon. For Danny Hogger. And I'm Tavis Beam. And Melissa <laughs> Yellow Beam. We'll see you on the next edition of Inspiring Teachers. Bye, everybody. Thank you.